How does the world work? Is it run on democratic ideals, where we collectively choose the laws of the lands we live in? Or is religion the guiding force? Are we still beholden to the teachings of spiritual figures that lived millenniums ago? Perhaps it's none of these. Maybe we're just witnessing the playing out of human nature on a global scale, with the world a reflection of our selfishness, greed and occasional kindness. These are all popular theories and ideas. However, I don't think any of them accurately depict how the world works in 2018. You see, I think the world can be very easily and accurately explained by some statistics that I'm going to share, you, share with you in a moment. Once you understand these statistics, you'll realize that as an adult living on planet Earth, you fall into one of three categories. Now, these categories explain your role in the world, your lifestyle and your opportunities. I'm sharing them with you today because I want to create a change. I want to break the wheel. By understanding how the world works, I'm hoping that not only can you live a happier and more fulfilling life, you can also help move humanity in a more positive direction. So without further ado, let me introduce to you my theory of how the world works and how you can help change it. As I mentioned earlier, as an adult living on planet Earth, you'll fall into one of three different categories. You'll fall into these categories depending on the amount of wealth you possess. That's your money in the bank, your stocks and savings, your property and any land that you own. Before I reveal these categories and you can discover which one you belong to, it's worth mentioning that the statistics I've used to create them are taken from the 2017 Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report. This divides the just over 5 billion adults living on planet Earth into four different wealth brackets. First, we have those with a value of over 1 million US dollars. Second, between 100,000 and a million. Third, between 10,000 and 100,000. And finally, those with a value of under 10,000 US dollars. Using these wealth brackets, I've created my own different categories, which I believe can fairly accurately predict your lifestyle, your opportunities and your role in the world. My intention is by explaining them and giving you a deeper understanding of your particular category, you'll be able to avoid some of the traps of how the world works and set yourself and others free. Here are the three different categories. If you're an adult living on planet Earth, you are one, either one of three things. You are either a king, you're either a facilitator, or you're one of the poor. And now this is how they break down. Right at the top we have the kings. This is 0.7% of the adult population, or 36 million people. They have a value of over 1 million US dollars, which makes up 129 trillion or 46% share of the total wealth in circulation. Beneath them, we have the facilitators. That's 29% of the adult population, or one and a half billion people, who have a wealth of between 10,000 and 1 million US dollars. You might be saying, oh, hold on, Joe, you talked earlier about four different wealth brackets when you mentioned the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report. Well, I've actually combined their second and third category to make my second category the facilitators. Now, you'll understand why as I go deeper into this and explain the role of the facilitators, but all you need to know for now is that that is two categories combined into one. Final category, by far the largest share of the adult population is the poor. That's 70% or three and a half billion people with a value of under 10,000 US dollars. They only have 7.6 trillion of the world's wealth, which only represents 3%. Now, interestingly enough, it's not the king with the great kings with the greatest share of the world's wealth. Very, very close, but with 51%, it's actually the facilitators. Now I'm gonna explain how these different categories work together and how the relationships work, what the different roles are, to give you a total picture of how the world works. Everything in this system is set up to make the kings richer and to increase their power. This is achieved through ownership. The kings own the companies that the facilitators and the poor work for, the houses they rent and the products that they buy. 
Therefore, the very act of engaging in this system strengthens the positions of the kings. We end up in a situation where 99.3% of the world's population works and lives so that 0.7% can do what they want. That's why modern life is so damn difficult. It's why you have to work 40 to 70 hours a week, yet can barely still make enough money to survive. It's why there are so many obstacles and hurdles to getting anything done. And it's why, as one of the facilitators of the poor, it's virtually impossible to raise and provide for a family without feeling incredibly stressed. This is how the world works. And when you understand it in this way, everything begins to make sense. Here are a few examples. Our governments don't exist to serve the interests of the people. Instead, they exist to protect the positions of the kings. This can be seen with the disproportionate influence that corporations exert over governments in countries like the US and the UK. It can also be seen in non-democratic countries where leaders siphon off taxpayers' money into their own offshore accounts. Our medical and pharmaceutical industries primary concern isn't the health of the world's population. Instead, it's to keep us ignorant about our health so that we'll keep spending billions on drugs and surgeries that we might not actually need. Our corporations don't exist to provide us with great products that improve our lives. Instead, they exist to create a false need for products that do nothing whatsoever to our quality of life. Our mainstream media doesn't exist to keep us informed about what's going on in the world. Instead, through a potent mix of fear and sensation, it exists to gain popular support for the king's agenda. This is how the world works in 2018, but it isn't how the world has to continue working as we move into the future. Let's take a deeper look now into each category and discuss your scope for both personal and global change. And the first category that I want to explore are the poor. Now you'll remember from my pyramid that they represent 70% of the world's population, but only have a 3% share of the total wealth in circulation. These are the people with less than uh, $10,000 of wealth. And in some extreme cases, the 25 poorest countries in the world, they exist on less than $3 a day per capita. That's why I say their lifestyle is one of daily struggle and hopelessness. They live in, in environments of pollution, overcrowding, crime and filth. And when you live in such an environment, it's very difficult to be positive about your prospects for change. Now, before I go any further, it's worth me saying that it's difficult for me to stand up here as a facilitator and make comments on the poor. I've had very little first-hand experience of life in this category. I spent three months working in a school, volunteering in a township in South Africa, and I've also recently returned from a trip to Nigeria, and that's it. So please bear with me. I don't want to come across as patronizing when I make these suggestions. The first thing I want to say is that one of the poor, you need to be aware that the kings need you distracted. They don't give a damn about you, and that's evident from the fact that they use none of their power, influence, and wealth to improve the conditions of the poor. And the reason for that is that 3% figure. As one of the poor, you only have a 3% share of the total wealth in circulation. So why should the kings care about you? You've got nothing to offer them, so they're not going to do anything to help you. However, just because they don't care about you doesn't mean they don't fear you. And the reason they fear you is because of your numbers. With 70% of the world's population, you're over double the size of the facilitators and you dwarf the 36 million kings. And because of your numbers, you've got to realize that you have strength in numbers and that you should bond together. Try to form a cohesive unit to challenge the power of the kings and the facilitators, to stand up for your rights. Now, my next suggestion is to reject religion. Now, I know this may sound controversial, but I just want you to listen to some statistics. Of the 19 richest countries in the world, when surveyed, 70% of the population reported saying that religion didn't matter to them or that they didn't believe. However, when the poorest 25 countries in the world were surveyed, 96 to 100% of them said that they believed and that religion was important to them. Can you see the correlation here? There seems to be a direct correlation between poverty and religion. And the more you believe, the poorer you will be. Now that's why I'm suggesting that you re reject religion. And I know when you exist in a, an environment of struggle and it's, the situation feels helpless, there can be a great need for escape. 
And I obviously understand that religion provides that. But when you're um, believing in a doctrine which teaches you to look at the afterlife and that there's perhaps not much you can do to change the here and now, it can really keep you chained to your environment. So that's why I'm suggesting that you reject religion. It will also free up a lot of time for you if you're not spending time going to church or to the mosque or going to religious festivals. You will have a chance to spend more time self-educating and self-improving. Use whatever resources you can. Now I exist, and now I understand, if you're existing in this category of the poor and you don't have a whole lot of money, you might not be able to buy courses and books and uh, attend universities and go online. You may not even have access to the internet. But whatever you can do to self-educate and self-improve, increase the value that you possess, I suggest that you take that time away from religion and pour it into that. Finally, I just want you to say, to talk about a mindset shift and believing that change is possible. I remember from my time in South Africa when I was working there volunteering, um, how uh, lovely and friendly the people were in the townships, but I was slightly upset to hear whenever they speak, none of them believed that change was possible. They didn't have an outlook that stretched beyond, stretched beyond the township. They didn't have a greater vision. And that's why I'm just suggesting that if you're one of the poor, you must believe that change is possible. As terrible and as difficult as your environment and circumstances are, they're not going to improve until you start to believe this. So I would advise you to make that shift in mindset and start looking and working towards a brighter future. Now the second category that we're going to explore are the facilitators. You'll remember from the pyramid that they represent 29% of the world's population and have a 51% share of the world's total wealth. Now these are the people that have a wealth of between 10,000 and 1 million US dollars. And I categorize their lifestyle as comfortable yet stressful and boring. I say comfortable because they face no of the hard, none of the hardships that the poor do. They're not in desperate environments. They've all got homes. They've all got three meals a day. They've definitely got clothes on their back. There's nothing, there's no imminent financial pressure on them. However, I say stressful and boring because their lives are generally dull. And this is usually the world of work which is to blame for this. There's a 2013 uh, um, Gallup poll of the Amer survey of the American workforce which reports that 71% of employed Americans said they either hated or didn't like their jobs. That's a hell of a lot of people being somewhere they don't want to be, doing things they don't want to do. So that's why I say that their existence is boring and unstimulating. The stressful part comes in because they're having to work 40, 50, 60 hours a week then they're having to go home and look after their families. They may have an hour commute each way. The list of things to do is endless. Facilitators are constantly busy and this adds to the stress of their lifestyle. Now, something you need to know as a facilitator is that you are kept in line, essentially kept in line by two things, either the fear of joining the poor or the fantasy of joining the rich. The paradox of being a facilitator is that you don't hugely enjoy your life, yet your levels of dissatisfaction aren't high enough to actually do anything to warrant changing it. And there's always these two different prongs, this pain and pleasure principle working away at you, keeping you in your position. The fear of joining the poor is flamed and fueled by the media. We're fed with images of how terrible it is to lose our money, to be out on our own, homeless, not have enough food, and images for people in developing countries and how terrible their lives are. And this puts us in a state of fear and makes us focus on money above everything else. The other end of it is the fantasy of joining the kings, which is purely a fantasy. The um, Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, which are the statistics I've used, when you look back through the years to 2012, which I think showed the greatest variance, only then, even then, the, the kings were 0.6% of the world's population instead of 0.7, represented 33 million in 30, instead of 36 million, which is this, it is today. So there's not a whole lot of movement from facilitator up to king. So it's really a fantasy that by working hard at your employed regular job that you're one day going to be rich and join the ranks of the kings. 
And once you realize this, and once you make this mind shift, a lot can change for you. Because the worst thing you can delude yourself into thinking as a facilitator is that you're working to make yourself rich. You're not. You're working to make the kings rich. You're working to make yourself comfortable. Comfortable is the best you're gonna have as a facilitator. And if that's okay with you, then fine. But if comfortable is something you don't want for your life, then you've got to look to make some changes. We've got to actually realize that the facilitators have a huge amount of power in this system. And the reason they have such power is because of the 51% ownership of wealth that they have. That's actually greater than the kings. But the facilitators squander this power. They use it to buy products that make the kings rich. They also work jobs which make the kings rich. If they woke up and realized this is not serving themselves, they're just serving the kings, then huge changes could occur. That's why I suggest that as a facilitator, you should pursue quality of life, not money. You're not in a position where you're about to slip below the poverty line. You're not struggling for food and accommodation. And as a result, you don't need to give in to the kings in the way that you do. You don't need to work overtime. You don't need to work 70 hours a week in pursuit of promotion. You can slow down, you can take it easy, you can focus on your hobbies, dreams and families. Ironically, by focusing on your dreams, that may be the one avenue you do have for joining the Kings. Um, but if you're more fam family or orientated, then why not improve your quality of life? Why not scale back on the amount of hours you work and spend more time with your children or with the relationships that are important to you? I guarantee you'll move out of this comfortable yet stressful and boring existence to being comfortable and enjoying yourself. One more thing I want to talk about on the, with the facilitators, but it also applies to the poor as well, and that is the shift in mindset and adamantly saying that you can't be bought. The way the kings manipulate this whole system, both the facilitators and the poor, is that they, they know and feel that they can, every facilitator and every member of the poor has a price. That's why we'll work boring jobs. We'll put up with the boredom and the stress because we're gonna get money at the end of it. That's why we'll do certain degrading things because we're going to get money. Whereas if you adopt an attitude that you can't be bought and then there's a line that can't be crossed, then that would change a whole lot of things. The last category that we're going to explore are the kings. These are the 36 million people on planet Earth with a wealth of over 1 million US dollars and their lifestyle can be categorized as one of confused freedom. I say freedom because they can do whatever they want. They can live in whatever home they want, they can travel to in any country in the world, they don't have to work if they don't want to, nothing is too expensive for them. So they've got this ultimate level of freedom that only 0.7% of the world's population experience. However, I call it a confused freedom because many of them don't understand why they're not feeling as happy as they should be. Why, when they have all this money and this power, do they not feel ecstatic every single day? Now, if you're a king and you're feeling that way, then I advise you to check out the 2010 study by psychologist Daniel Kahneman and economist Angus Keaton. Deaton. They discovered that there's a, a figure, an income figure, $75,000 a year, that once beyond you go beyond that, the level of happiness you experience doesn't proportionately grow with the amount of money you make. Now look at that figure, $75,000 a year. That's poor, more facilitator money. That's not even, that's not king level. Imagine if you're a king with a hundred million. Basically, it's suggesting that making another 100 million or going for 500 or aiming for a billion really isn't gonna do a whole lot to your happiness. It's certainly not gonna make you feel 10 times happier. There's something else as well known in psychology as hedonic adaptation, which all humans seem to possess, a self-regulating system, whereby we get normalized to pretty much any environment we're in. So for example, you buy a brand new Ferrari and you feel fantastic for a few weeks, but after then it begins to feel normal, just the same as you if you were driving a Volkswagen. The same would apply to a huge mansion you buy. It may feel amazing for six months, but after a while it begins to feel normal again. So what this is telling you as a king is that your happiness 
beyond a certain point can't be found in material things. So you trying to acquire more and more money and power, you're probably looking in the wrong direction. So what you should be doing instead is to use your wealth and power to improve the lives of all. This is how you create a legacy. This is how you become a hero. This is how you raise your quality of life and give yourself that deep need for fulfillment. So when I say use your wealth and power to improve the lives of all, what I'm talking about is the fantastic position that kings are in. With all of that wealth and influence they have, they can directly influence the lives of the poor and raise them out of the conditions they're in. Imagine if that's you and that's your opportunity you have as a king. The opportunities you have are far greater than the poor who are just struggling to survive and the facilitators who are too stressed and busy to really try to make any changes. You, on the other hand, without all of these stresses and struggle, can really focus on doing some good in the world. So what I'm suggesting when I say create a legacy or become a hero is use your money for good. There are so many things that you can do. For example, I was at a convention a few months ago, personal development convention, and a man was giving a talk and he was previously a facilitator and he's risen to the rank of a king through some property investments that he'd made. Now he was talking and asking people to try to help him as he was funding this campaign to build water towers in Gambia. Now he was a king, a very low level king, but he was still, he wasn't using, he'd realized that the only way to gain that satisfaction that he sought was by making a change and helping others. There are so many other suggestions as well. As a king, you could buy up land in the Amazon forest and ensure that it's not gonna be used for development or other wilderness areas. As a king, with all your wealth, power and influence, you could influence governments to help the poor instead of protect your own interests as kings. There's so much scope for what you can do when, when you're a king and you have so many opportunities. So please make sure you take them. And obviously, just to add at the end as well, when I talk about kings, there are plenty of women involved in this category as well. It's not uh, gender specific, male or female, kings applies to everyone. And I hope my suggestions of here have got you thinking. This whole system, as much as I've berated the kings previously, we're all people, we're all people living on this planet Earth. And it shouldn't be about fighting each other. It shouldn't be about revolution and war. It should just be about a new level of consciousness. And once as a king you adopt this level of consciousness, not only are you gonna improve your life, you're gonna make the world a whole lot better as well. So that's the end of my breakdown. I hope you found it useful. My advice to you is you start thinking of the world in terms of kings, facilitators and poor, rather than capitalism, socialism, races, religions, nations, middle class and working class. These categories may have been a good way of understanding the world in the past, but they aren't gonna give you a proper understanding of how the world works today. When you remember that 99.3% of the world's population is living and working, so the 0.7% can do what they want, everything becomes a lot clearer. Apply this filter to your thinking and you'll begin to see what's going on behind the facade. As I mentioned earlier, war or armed revolution is not the answer to this situation. I want to finish this video by reading you a quote from the late inventor and architect Buckminster Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. As much as I berated the kings for their short-sighted behavior, I'm not calling for their elimination. They, as much as the facilitators and the poor, are part of the solution. Ironically, this solution is fairly easy to achieve. If the poor realize that they have the power to change their environment, the facilitators stop allowing themselves to be manipulated by money, and the kings realize that the accumulation of even great and wealth isn't going to make them happier, then we'd already be over halfway to making this world a better place. So don't be tricked into thinking this system can never change. That's what the kings want you to believe. Instead, realize that your daily actions, purchases, and choices do have an impact. So make it a positive one. Be the change in the world you want to see.